First of all, I want to thank Michael because he has the most difficult job of taking care of Phyllis. But in any case, um, James, you are fabulous. It's my emails. <laughs> anyway, I do try though. Good afternoon, friends and newcomers to our Friday special conversations with special people. Today we have a wonderful speaker, James McGowan, Senior Advisor to the UN Development Program. James first spoke here at our library lecture series group on April 30th, 2015 on the topic Global Environmental Challenges, and then on January 26, 2017 on the topic Further Climate Change News. All of these things could be spoken about, but James wrote a fabulous article and paper, and he's going to speak on a topic that I find so fascinating. It's so frustrating to see such injustice that was done to our Native Americans. And James calls it Song of Water, Sacred Landscapes, Native Nations, and Religious Freedom. There is so much to learn. And please let us give a very warm welcome to our very special guest, James McGowan. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Phyllis. Well, I mean, we're all locked down here in our various homes and our various, you know, I see somebody's on a staircase, that's great. I'm like, you know, in a closet, I've got a 16 year old who's just finishing up her school day. I've got the dog here. So it's all very haphazard and kind of last minute, but oh, we'll, we'll, do our, we'll do our best. Hopefully there won't be too many interruptions. We'll see how it goes. But it's a long, long story. And it's really hard to know to start with the cultural conflict, you know, that we're gonna to discuss today because it, you know, it's so wrapped up with the environmental catastrophe that we're facing. Um, they're directly interrelated and they're so big, it's, it's really hard to know, you know, where to start. But, you know, you can start with the pandemic. I mean, we, we knew that this was coming 20 years ago because of the way that lands are being destroyed and the way that wild animals are being treated as bushmeat in some of these uh, wet markets and others coming into contact with industrial agriculture, which is also kind of, you know, very harmful, obviously, to, to other uh, life forms. You know, we could open with that, or we could, we could talk about climate change, which, you know, is the result of our view that the sky is a giant garbage dump, just pollute at will, um, and just go places or, or, or you know, do, do the simplest things. Um, or the idea that, you know, we can make everything out of plastic, and not worry that it's gonna wind up in the waterways and in the oceans and the drinking water and in the seafood that we eat to the point where now we're consuming about a card's worth of plastic every year, um, every one of us. So, you know, each of these problems kind of has its roots in the idea that it's our, our background, our, the Western you know, civilization, it's okay to poison the earth, the air, the water in the name of progress or in the name of profit. And uh, so, you know, we don't necessarily um, see these elements as part of ourselves or part of our culture. There's a sort of a divorce that occurred in a sense between the natural world and human culture when, you know, the flowering of, of, of science and so forth sort of began to cause a schism which started to see the world as an object, um, as just a dead material object and other living beings as soulless or whatever or lesser and so forth. Well, you know, there are 500 recognized Native Nation um, states, and none of them see uh, environments that way. They all see them as very much alive, um, and, and, and in many ways, the equal to their culture, or their brothers, their sisters, they, they, they call their, you know, uh, species. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really hard to, to know. I find Deloria who was a fantastic, he, he died recently, he was a fantastic, and he was a professor at UC Boulder, he was a lawyer, he went to divinity school, but he was a Standing Rock Sioux, um, a man from a, a, a kind of great lineage, his family. He, he, he kind of divided things up and said, well, the Western view sees things in time. There are these events that occurred in time, and we look at those events in terms of our religious culture, as something that we can look to to provide us with insights as to how to live. Whereas the native people were rooted in place, 
not in time. So their mode of revelation was in a specific place. And each one of the tribes usually had a place of power, a sacred place, which would then be a ceremonial place where people would go and open themselves up and see what happened. Hopefully healing, hopefully, you know, revelations. So it was an ongoing process that would go around the cycles and it would be a specific ceremony at a specific site at a specific time of year. So um, they were very different. And, you know, one was like an arrow, one was like a circle, and they just, they came into conflict. And I came, you know, I came across these, these um, um, law, you know, uh, cases from the 80s. When, well, first of all, let me go back a little bit and just say that, of course, um, in order to, to colonize and what they saw as pacify, the uh, native people uh, where uh, they were colonized, they would strip them of the culture. So their language was made illegal to speak. Their religion was made uh, illegal to practice. So there could be no ceremonials. Medicine men, we would consider to be, you know, priests, reverend. They would be, they would be put in jail if, um, you know, they were caught practicing any ceremonies. Um, and, and, you know, sacred sites, usually they, they would build, a, you know, sometimes they would build a church right on top of the sacred site just to dominate that. So, so, and then, of course, children were sent to boarding schools and forbidden to speak their language and all those things at boarding schools by the thousands. And the idea there was, you know, say, you know, kill the Indian and save the man, whatever, so that they would destroy their cultural background and bring them into what the mainstream culture considered to be superior way to live in the 1880s. Um, so that, that being the background, those people were very, it was extremely traumatized. So it was, it was a very, um, it's not a surprising, none of, the, none of their um, spiritual practices are proselytizing or they're looking for people. They're quite secretive on the other hand where they need the privacy in order to participate fully in their ceremonies of a sacred site. So that became another kind of challenge. <coughs> it became a legal situation because it's different. They're so very, very different from the, from the Western religions. Um, so um, I don't know if anyone got the chance. I don't know if anyone got the chance to see um, the, the little paper that I, I did write. But um, what happened was that they, the, the Native people, they got, first of all, they got the right to vote in 1927. And then uh, the religions were made legal, if you were, shortly thereafter. But really, things didn't pick up until the late 70s when the Native American Graves Repatriation Act was passed. And then also, um, they tried to get protection for sacred sites because what would typically happen is that the government would, you know, all the government, uh, you know, basically appropriated all the tribal lands and put them on small reservations. So all of a sudden, the government has all this land. Some of the sites are on government land. Some of the sites are on, you know, other types of, of, of land now. Or, and then in the 80s, and the government would say, well, we want to flood this area to create a dam, or we want to, you know, we want to clear cut this area, or we want to, and the Native people said, well, wait a second now. Uh, we have the Native American Religious Freedom Act, and we're going to, uh, we, that was passed by Congress to protect our religious freedom, so they could grow their long hair with ponytails in prisons, which they consider to be part of their religion, a sacred thing, uh, or even take peyote uh, as part of the Native American church uh, when they're in prison, that's, that's how that they worship. Um, so along with that comes the protection of land. And um, uh, the one that I really got most involved with is up in Montana, it's the last great waterfall in Montana, and, or actually in the whole, uh, you know, uh, North America, that's not dammed. And they wanted to, to put a dam on it. So I went out, I met the medicine man who was involved with that lawsuit, and then started to dig back and look at the other lawsuits that had come before that. There was one, uh, I'm now in Atlanta, there was one not too far from here in Tennessee, where the Tennessee Valley wanted to flood the Cherokees Chota, which was considered to be the foremost 
archaeological site, in fact, in the whole Appalachian chain, in addition to the sacred site for Cherokee people. But Cherokee people, of course, were removed, the, the majority of them were removed from this area on the Trail of Tears, which was the result of uh, President Andrew Jackson breaking the Supreme Court's um, law which said that it would be illegal to remove these people. Jack, Jack said, Marshall made his law, now let him enforce it. Supreme Court didn't have an army. Jackson had the army. He marched the Cherokees right out because there was gold in the hills that he wanted. So most of those people were sent on the Trail of Tears. 16,000 people were, re, were removed, marched you know, 16, 000, 1,600 miles to Oklahoma. 4,000 of them died, either through violence or through, you know, um, just the conditions. At any rate, the Cherokee people brought a lawsuit saying, you can't do that because that's the only place where Cherokee, you know, original Cherokee religion, traditional Cherokee religion can be practiced. We're not a, um, a society that can pick up and say, oh, we're just going to go to this church, we're going to go to that temple, we're going to go to this mosque. No, ours is set in that one spot. Doesn't go, it doesn't go anywhere else. And so you can imagine if that is the case, if that is your, you know, your cathedral, the attachment that you have to all the species, every, everything has a name, everything is known extremely well. And it's part of your you know, ancestry, part of your life. It's part of your spiritual outlook to see things in that way. So they took that to court. Unfortunately, the judge uh, in that case said, no, it's the government's land. They're going to do what they want, you know, but it was really quite a interesting thing because there were studies done that showed the dam was going to lose a million dollars a year in operation. However, there was a whole group of developers and speculators who were going to make money around the lake that was going to be created. And so they put a rider through Congress and then they, 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 got, they got the dam built. It's called the, the Teleco Dam on the, Little Tennessee River, and it's still being operated today. I don't know if it's producing energy. Uh, however, they had to violate the an Endangered Species Act because there was the snail darter. Maybe some people kind of can even remember this. It wasn't that long ago. There was a snail darter. So they had to break the Endangered Species Law. They had to break the Native American Religious Freedom Act. They had to do all these things, and they just they just bulldozed them, and they, they did it. But it caused such an outroar uproar at, amongst people who were outraged that it turned the American public against dams. And since that time, there have really been no big dam projects. In fact, dams are being taken down now in order to let fish uh, flow, especially salmon in the West. So dams are being taken down. That was kind of, turn, it was an interesting turning point. So although the Cherokee lost, in a sense, they won because American public became aware all of a sudden of the ecological cost of flooding large areas uh, like they do, especially when there's, um, you know, these cultural and other, other uh, issues. Um, so I found out about that one, which was really interesting. Uh, Judge Robert Taylor, he agreed with TVA. Um, you know, he, he recognized, so the, the claimants, the Cherokee brought, it was a First Amendment. They, they said, you're violating our right to practice religion by building this dam. And so you really had kind of in that case, the first time at any level where a court heard an opinion uh, that, uh, you know, um, that, that land, that land, American land was sacred. There was a, something religious about an American landscape. And of course, tribes have been here for, you know, some people say 25, some people say 30, nobody even really knows, but tens of thousands of years. So they have, you know, um, <laughs> developed an understanding of the ecosystem and developed an understanding of the animals and so forth and of specific sites um, that is just thousands of years old. And they've developed ceremonies to relate to those places. Um, so you can understand why they would feel that way. Although for people who just understand deeds and property rights and so forth, it's a very alien concept, you know, um, because they don't really own the land, you know, um, in the same sense that we consider that. Like people talk about how Manhattan was bought for trinkets or whatever. That's not the case at all. 
that was just like a goodwill offering and maybe the ability to hunt for a season. They did not think of it the land was going to be taken from them in Manhattan or anywhere else really. So it was always in the early, early days, the 1600s, it was always the understanding that it was sort of a goodwill gesture, peace offering. You can use this land for hunting, but not that you, you can drive us off it and you're going to suddenly have it. That was never the understanding. So at any rate, that was in the Tennessee Valley uh, case. Uh, so uh, he said the Cherokee had proven that the dam would halt their ceremonies obliterate the physical vestiges of their history and culture and destroy the sacred reality at the heart of Cherokee religion. But the Tennessee Valley Authority asserted that the constitution afforded no protection for religious belief and practice regarding land unless the plaintiff owned the property. So you see this conflict between property rights and the idea of a land is something that's religious, something sacred. So that was the first one. So like I said, it was a huge controversy which did then turn the public against dams. Um, so I'm going to then just run through quickly the next few, uh, that happened, um, was the Navajo did a similar thing where uh, they wanted to protect Rainbow Bridge, which is a soaring stone arch, um, from the Glen Canyon Dam. Um, the Hopi and the Navajo then joined forces also to try to block the expansion of a ski area on the San Francisco peaks, which is a very sacred area where the, the yeah, you, you, you know, they have a whole mythology about that area. It's, it's very special to them. Um, and then the, the Lakota brought a petition to protect uh, Bear Butte, which is their prayer site, defacement by tourist facilities. Um, so they, you know, they said that, look, this is like setting up a, you know, a Kool-Aid stand at the tomb for the unknown soldier. It's just very disrespectful. You can't just start putting these concessions around Bear Butte. It's, it's going to, re, you know, ruin our, our, the practice of our religion. All of those were struck down. Uh, the, the government bulldozed all of them. But each of them testified to the spiritual character uh, of those places and their importance within the community life. They evoke patterns of thought, land, behavior, that gave uh, witness to you know, the perception of the natural world uh, as sacred. So time after time, tribal members would come in and talk, you know, usually in, in closed door sessions, since a lot of this stuff is kind of you know, confidential, secret. And, and they, they would talk about how you know, these spe specific areas, uh, if they were destroyed, would be the destruction of their, the core of their culture. So, and the religion being kind of the core of their you know, life way and vision of the world and so forth. Um, so the final one, which, which uh, I wrote most of, of uh, my paper about, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And this one involved the ancient redwood forests of Northern California, which I don't know if anyone's ever been out to the redwoods. They're just majestic, breathtaking places, which you certainly don't need to be a local travel person to see how they have spiritual content. I mean, they are truly uh, amazing places. So there's one place there, and, uh, I, mean, I don't want to get too far ahead. Let's see. Uh, so yeah, the Pacific Northwest. So they, they, um, the, the, the Yurok, Karak, and Hoopa tribes out there, they have a very distinct cosmology whereby they have to perform these ceremonies in, at, at this time of year, actually, right now, they're probably going on. They're called the world renewal ceremonies. And they believe that these ceremonies have to be put on. Otherwise, the earth becomes unstable. So these are cultures that have lived through ice ages, lived through all kinds of you know, unbelievable situations and the cultures have survived. And they've developed these ceremonies in the belief that the world renewal ceremonies, you don't perform them, the world doesn't continue. So for them it was not only a life and death you know, situation for themselves, but as they saw it for like everyone, so it's kind of interesting now that we're finding out that redwood forests are the largest carbon storage forests in the world, more than the Amazon jungle or, or undersea kelp forests or anywhere, because the massive you know, trunks of those redwoods store so much carbon. And I don't know what's happening right now with the wildfires out there. They might be releasing a lot of that carbon. But you know, redwoods also need fire to reproduce. That's how they reproduce, unless the fire gets all the way up to the very high um, crown, and if it burns that, then the redwood will die. But it needs, it need, they need fire. So at any rate, um, they uh, they took you know their their case for the world renewal ceremonies 
um, but believe, in the belief that it, they exert a strong stabilizing effect uh, on, on the earth, on the climate. Um, let me just turn this phone off for a second. Hold on. Um, and, and they took that to court. So, but you know, it's funny. They too, the history of these people is, is just unbelievable. Like the, the Cherokees faced the genocide of the Trail of Tears, but these tribes in the Northwest faced in some ways an even worse fate, which was the gold rush. So when the gold rush happened in their territories, they were massacred, just flat out, you know, killed um, and kidnapped. And there were bounties on them, just, you know, just bring in a, a, an Indian scalp and we'll give you $25. They just tried to exterminate these people and steal their land during the gold rush. They survived it amazingly, so incredibly, you know, just like by, by, by getting out of their way, getting into the hills, because these were really desperate, with something like uh, 100,000 gold miners rushing into the area. And these were, these were just, you know, a lot of these people were just bloodthirsty murderers, and they just killed the tribal people. Anyway, they survived that, and they kept their ceremonies going. But then after the gold rush petered out, and it petered out pretty fast, it really only lasted about five, ten, you know, years, and it was over. All those gold miners looked up at the redwoods and saw, oh, wow, this is gold. We're going to cut these trees down and sell them. So very quickly, that area became the largest timber producing area in the world. And they just started clear cutting. The government built the roads and built all the infrastructure. And billions and billions of dollars were made decimating these forests out there, which had tremendous you know, detrimental effects for the ecosystems, obviously. <laughs> Um, so they, um, the, but they, so yeah, they, they pray for the health of everything. Like I was saying, it's the well-being of all things. They sing, they dance, they heal the community. So when it came down to one of the final sections that wasn't logged, it's called the high country. It's up on a peak. And this is where they go for, um, vision quests. You, you know, even as a tribal member, you don't go up there unless you've gone through an extensive preparation, you know, fasting, sweat lodges. You have to ha feel like the mountain has invited you. I mean, all kinds of things to even go up there. Then you go up there and you can spend like four or five days up there. And supposedly, you know, it's really powerful. You get, you know, their visions that people have for the continuation of the tribe and what to do and decisions and all kinds of things. It's your ma major prayer spot. Well, of course, the loggers wanted that. They wanted those, it was only 7,000 acres, but they wanted that. They wanted to log that. And so this went to court. And um, so it was, it, was, it was estimated $50 billion that they were gonna get from these, from these trees. And the Forest Service um, decided that, okay, we're gonna fulfill our responsibility to the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. And we're gonna have a study done about the cultural relevance of this area. So it was called the Theor Theoratus Report. Theodoratus Report. And came to the conclusion that yes, you know, um, it's, it's a sacred area. It's crucial to their culture. Can't, you, you destroy this area, you're gonna destroy their culture. And so it said, although specific religious sites are identified with this, within this region, the entirety of the region possesses a generalized sanctity, which is necessary for the proper use of specific sacred sites. So the report criticized the ignorance of the Forest Service regarding the area's basic, you know, uh, religious significance, physical features. It verified that the high country is the seat of one of the great flowerings of Native American culture anywhere in the United States and of signal importance to our overall national culture. So, um, and, and a point crucial to legal art that a mental shift was required from thinking of the sacred sites as simply locations for prayer and rituals to that of a holy reality themselves, which give meaning to those activities. So it concluded that the Forest Service proposal would violate uh, the law because the intrusions would be destructive to the very core of Northwest religious beliefs and practices. So um, that's what the report said, that the Forest Service you know, commissioned themselves. Still, despite the outcries from fishermen, scientists, environmental groups, the groups, the Forest Service, man, we're going to de defy the report. 
that we commissioned ourselves and we're going to build this logging road right through the most important sacred site in the high country the tribe stopped, tried everything to try to stop it um in the end they had to file a suit against the government first amendment violation um lawsuit um, the Forest Service pointed to earlier precedents of court rulings saying, you know, we have the right to extract whatever resources we want from the land. It's our land. We're going to do what we want from it. The inconvenient history of how the Forest Service got that land <laughs> disregarded once again. Um, however, in the first victory, the judge of the Northern District of California found that the Forest Service Road would violate the tribe's constitutional guarantee to freedom of religion. And he characterized the Forest Service plan as desecration of rever revered land, stating that its solitude, quiet, and pristine environment are crucial to the emotional and spiritual exchange with the creator. So he ordered the Forest Service to permanently stop the road. Now, the Forest Service could have said, okay, you know, fine, that, but they didn't. They said, we're going to appeal this to the higher court. So they went up to the Ninth Circuit Court, which upheld the lower court. Again, they were not satisfied. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of the United States chose to hear the case. It was called uh, Ling, who was the, he was the supervisor of the Forest Service uh, versus the Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association. And uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the first time the highest court in the land uh, had ever heard an argument about the holiness of an American landscape itself. Um, now, the Supreme Court, following a long set of precedents, had a process set up that has to be followed when it takes into account, you know, extraordinary measures that might violate the free exercise of religion. First, the court has to determine if the governmental action would interfere with the belief or practice of religion. If so, then the government has to prove a compelling state interest of the highest order that cannot be satisfied by any other means. So in the Ling case, first off, the court threw out that its own rule, rule book and refused to adhere to a two-step process. Justice William Brennan was the main voice against all this. He said, this is totally irresponsible. It's an indefensible, indefensible abdication of, jur of judicial responsibility, right off the bat. So they knew that they had an enemy in him right away. Um, so a lot of back and forth went on because the lawyers for the Forest Service were using every possible angle, claiming that you know it was an establishment of religion. If you gave the tribes the right to protect this, then where does it end? That's what they were really, I think, were afraid of. They were afraid of tribes coming, you know, from all over the place and saying, hey. Okay, this is our sacred site over here. We haven't told you because it's secret. Over here, they were, they were deathly afraid of this. So they used every angle, every twisted every arm, did everything they could to try to get a positive outcome. Which in the end they did by a very close margin. Um, so um, they overruled the lower court rulings and permitted the government to proceed with its quote unquote development plan. Justice Brennan wrote the, uh, the dissent, and it was blistering. He, he wrote, um, this case represents yet another stress point in a long-standing conflict between two disparate cultures, the dominant Western culture, which views land in terms of ownership and use, and that of Native Americans, which views land in terms of, which, which, in which concepts of private property are not only alien, but contrary to a belief system that holds land sacred. On the other side was Justice O'Connor, who defended the dominant paradigm of land as property by stating that her majority report that the Forest Service could virtually destroy the Indians' ability to practice their religion. Still, they deserve no constitutional protection in this case. She said, whatever rights the Indians may have to use the area, those rights do not divest the government of its right to use what is, after all, its land. Brennan came back and pointed out that the, the ruling was cruelly surreal in that the only religious freedom it granted would be to protect the belief that their religion will be destroyed. So, um, you know, in a marked contrast to traditional Western religions, 
The belief systems of Native Americans do not rely on doctrines, creeds, or dogmas. The site-specific nature of Indian religious practices derives from the Native American perspective that the land itself is a sacred living being with specific sites possessing different spiritual properties and significance. So facing destruction of their culture, the tribes went to the Organization of American States um, and, and, and uh, you know, to investigate the logging plan as a violation of, of human rights. The US government decided we don't want the international embarrassment. And so in the end, they took the area and they put it into protection. They protected it as part of the Smith River National um, Recreation Site. So the road was never built. A high country uh, today is a preserved oasis amidst clear-cut forests. Um, and world renewal ceremonies continue, and they're happening probably right now. So it was always a uh, legal loss, the area was not law. And so that seemed to be a sort of a trend. It was interesting. Although they would lose the cases, they would get what they needed, which was, it happened almost every time, you know, not every time, but I would say like, you know, probably most of the time and most of the cases, I think there's six or seven of them. Um, and the Kootenai Falls case, back to that, which is the one where I went out and, and met with the, the medicine man, Pat Lefthand, the way they saved that, okay, that was in charge of an administrative law judge was in charge of that case because the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission wanted to build a dam and they took the case to the federal, to, to an administrative law judge. Pat Lefthand took the judge one day out to the falls, out to the site. And it's not just like a big one fall. It's this cascading, amazing waterfall situation with rocks that you can go walk out onto and sit as this water, crystal clear water streams all around you. It's, it's just huge. Took the judge out there and he had such an experience out there that he came back and he said, no dam. So that was the only outright legal win that this had to protect one of their sacred sites was Kootenai Falls in Northwest Montana. And that was a really, really emotional case. I mean, the, the people were just, they were so happy. They were just crying. They were so, you know, it was, it was either the end of their lives or, or, you know, the continuation of their culture for their children forever. So I can't explain to you how important it was for them. Um, so it was a huge moment of, uh, of victory. So, you know, industrial civilization succeeded in making the earth uninhabitable for humans. Uh, because we've downgraded, you know, the real world, the actual world, kind of in favor of a supernatural world, whatever, or whatever you might say, you know, where we can take our religion wherever we want to go and we have these beliefs and so forth. Whereas the Native people have very specific, this material thing right here is our revelatory, you know, area. And if you, if you destroy that, you, our religion, that's, it's gone. You can't say, we're going to carry it with us. We're gonna, no. Does, there's none of that. It is their book. And that's in this country. And there are these sites are all over. And, there, and so many of the tribes are starting to come out with their practices and so forth. They want to be very careful because they don't want a lot of non-Indian people flooding into these areas and disturbing their, you know, their ceremonies, which have gone on now for tens of thousands of years. So they're, they're being very careful about it, but they're still on their fire. You know, um, in, in the Grand Canyon area, the uranium miners constantly, constantly trying to threaten this one site there. Um, so it's, it's, it's no, no matter where you look out west, there's, there are problems like this. But it seems like, you know, the U.S. Constitution might be capable of protecting these religions. Um, and if so, in a sense, the Constitution could be used to enlighten the American public about what they're doing when they wantonly, you know, destroy um, the cleanliness of the air, which is causing climate change, the water, which if you look at Flint, Michigan, and you look at even South Orange, we had that PFOA uh, problem. Now we have to have um, air strippers. So all these problems that we're causing for ourselves, so our basic science. So the ancient traditional, you know, medicine people of the tribes who lived here and the Scientists are not the same line, you know, ironically. So <laughs> you, we're seeing a very interesting time in cultural development, I think, in this country, where we just need a couple more steps, I think. If we have a couple more good legal cases, people will pay attention, people will begin to appreciate, you know, and, you know, 
what they have in terms of their operating ecosystems that are providing them with clean air for sure. I don't know if you've noticed down there, but I mean up there, but down here, the sky has been so much clearer without all the jets. And the, you know, I mean, it's very quickly returning to normal uh, in terms of air quality, poor air quality. But for a while there, crystal clear air, beautiful, amazing, because people were driving less, people were flying less, um, and all this. So things can be done. We can decarbonize. I know that we can get rid of our fossil fuels. We have alternatives for just about everything. Um, you know, we can protect our water because it's just a matter of respect there, mainly for, for, for the importance of water. And I know that we can change uh, the way that we uh, deal with landscapes because, you know, we're gobbling it up way too fast. And I think that organic agriculture is coming along very quickly. People are getting more, you know, aware of their uh, carbon footprints and of the footprints of the uh, various fertilizers and pesticides or herbicides that are put on foods. They want organic foods now more than ever. So things are happening in a positive way. Um, but I would say that, you know, as you look at wildfires, look what's happening in the West. Wildfires, record temperatures. We're going to have two, for the first time in history, two hurricanes hitting the Gulf of Mexico next week. Never happened before. So the increase in water temperature in the Gulf of Mexico causing these crazy situations, crazy storms. Heat out in, in California, like I said, drying everything out and burning everything. Um, you know, here we're having a lot of flooding, almost too much uh, happening. And, and, and some very, you know, storms are coming up, going all the way up the East Coast. Look what happened, Sandy. And of course, sea level rise, um, the ultimate kind of um, problem that New York is going to face. And there's just no way around it, especially the airports. Um, are all a result of just thinking about short-term, you know, profit. And that goes back to the idea that it's okay to poison the air. It's okay, because it's, we have progress. We, no, it's, you know, for them, it's, it's not okay. And it's just basic common sense. And so, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these cultural happenings are, I think, you know, coming together, I'm hoping to, to create something coming from the native people and coming from really good um, sort of legal decisions that could um, protect what we have left. So I didn't have a lot of time to go through or didn't want to bore you too much with too many of the details of the cases. A lot of them are very interesting because of the way they tried to pit the establishment of religion versus freedom of religion and that whole con you know, uh, um, a conflict there came out in some of these cases in very interesting ways. I'm not a lawyer, but it still interested me. And, uh, you know, just, just the reverence. What, what I came away with is just the respect and the reverence that they have. It's an emotional thing, very emotional attachment that they have that I think we need to build. Then, you know, how many generations? I'm only one, three, you know, four generations or something, 120 years my family's, my particular family's been here. They've been here for 20,000 years. So we really have to pick up their view, I think, for ourselves, rather than bringing with us a lot of ideas that might harm what is really their, you know, their landscape. So I'm down here in, you know, in Cherokee and uh, Creek, which is Muskogee country, you know. Um, and, you know, I try to always remember that's where I am, wherever I am. Um, there are still tribal people here. It was their land. And what do they have to teach me wherever I, wherever I may be in the country, you know, about their landscape? Because they're the experts. So oh, I don't know if anyone else is, if I've bored everyone to tears or um, uh, if anyone has any questions, but uh, I'm happy to talk with you if you'd like um, about my experience. I'd just like to say, James, you were fabulous. And no one could be bored by it because you touched upon not only what's happening to the Native Americans, but an awareness of what's happening to our planet. Yep. And uh, when you, I know you, you're an expert in what's happening with the climate change and what's happening with the water. And, and um, you described it perfectly. And um, I was fortunate enough to see Rainbow Bridge and the Redwoods. And, and I also had, um, I just have to say, I had a, a professor uh, from Drew years ago who told us he worked for the government and um, federal for federal lands 
and it was in Wyoming, I think, that um, the Indians were fighting because it was a sacred mountain. And um, of course, the Indians said, there's so many other mountains, why do they have to use this particular one? And the federal <laughs> government ruled in favor of not the Indians. <laughs> Let's yeah. put it. And I, yeah. I hate to say this, but we need the leadership. It has to start from the top. And like Teddy Roosevelt, he believed in, in um, the national parks and, and you know, saving and, and, and the, the importance of the land as compared to the power of money. And uh, I think that that's, that's a core thing because it has to start from the top for people to be aware. Right now, people aren't aware of what's happening when they show Indians fighting in North Dakota for their land, for their water, for everything. It seems very distant and they don't see the connection of what it, of how we're one land and one people. Very and you, you, you explained it perfectly, so thank you so much. I want to thank you. I want to echo the thanks. I, I see Zia wants to ask a question and I'll unmute yes. everybody after that so that we yes, can uh, take questions I'm, from whoever. I'm, yeah, I, I just uh, am curious to find out if you are aware that this version of the American story is taught at any level in schools or colleges or anywhere. That's a great question. That is, that, you know, is. that is really, because it's, it's, a gener it's a generational thing. It will take a generation at least if we started now. It's not. Unfortunately, it's not. They don't know anything. I mean, we don't know. We're taught the, the, the bare, bare minimum about things. We know all kinds of things about, you know, European history. And I mean, of course, it's important. I'm not going to do a little, but it seems like, right, we should know. Every school child should know, okay, whose land am I, is my house on? Is this high school on? What was their story? How did it, you know, why aren't they not still as populous as they were? But no, they're not, it's not. And it's almost as though, it's almost as though we're still threatened, you know, by their ownership, by their rightful ownership. In many cases, the land was stolen in many cases. And so it's almost as though it's the original sin of America that we, and we don't want to face it. And uh, it's, but it needs to be done. It needs to be incorporated into the curriculum from very early on and not lightly, but deeply to understand, you know, the settler colonial situation, um, just, you know, the, the what smallpox, everything that happened, it, it, it should all be told because it's fascinating. We have such a short view in general too. We only look at like since 1776, it's really all that we, you know, but what for, for you know, 200 years before that. I mean, interesting things were happening in 50s in the West with the Spanish. And, and um, the, the Indians out there say, oh, no, they didn't bring horses. this idea that they horses. They didn't bring horses. We always had horses. We had smaller horses, but we had, you know. So there's all these things that are still unresolved, even archaeologically unresolved. That, that, so it's almost like they're afraid. But yes, no, it's not. But it, it should be. It really should be. And that's it's really a great point. I believe that if Howard Zinn's story of the American peoples was on the curriculum, a lot of young people would learn what actually went on. Oh, yeah. Nobody yeah. was aware of it. I asked several people, and that's not part of the history. They only learn the sanitized part that people right. want to learn. Well, <laughs> back to what phyllis said about teddy roosevelt and the national parks and yeah kids need to learn the history of creating the national parks which in some ways was appropriating native land and putting it under united states government control where something can be with the wave of a hand unprotected again so everything is way more complex and I'm a big believer that kids can learn concept, complex con, uh, context for, for the, the things they're learning and that as they progress in education, more depth is added to, you know, all the history and social concepts they're studying. Right, especially now that fracking is such a controversial 
uh, activity and it's being encouraged and then it gets wiped out and then it comes back because there are people who are interested in treating the land the way, the way that they have been doing in the past. So children really, the next generation needs to learn and they need to know what went on and what exactly is going on now. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, one of the most satisfying things, I don't know if, if, if you know, but I was um, one of the, the people who started the River Day in South Orange. And one of the great joys that I had was when a middle school teacher uh, decided he was going to incorporate the river into his science curriculum. Right. And the kids took to this, like, you can't believe. And uh, they would set up 40 or 50 exhibits, tables at River Day yeah. based on their independent research. You know, these are fourth, these are, what were they, fifth graders? Right. Uh, six, six, you know, fifth to eighth graders. And they got so into it. And, and they, you know, it's just, a, it, it's a universal thing. Yeah. That I think we get drummed out of us. The love of, you know, the natural world is something that we have as children very strongly, you know, and it takes a lot for them, you know, for society, whatever, to get us to just, you know, turn our heads and not think, think it's normal if, you know, a natural area gets bulldozed for a mall or something, you know, we just, we, <clears throat> but as kids, it's horrifying, you know, as kids, we just can't understand that. So I think that, that they are really ready to learn a lot of these things and the sooner that they learn them and they begin to get interested in them because there's so much to read i mean there's so many great books that are constantly coming out by native americans um you know there's great book, indian givers indian givers which um talks about you know the fact that agriculture as we know it is a native american construct right. um you know Tomatoes, potatoes, corn. I mean, just the, the lift is just like almost, you know, almost everything other than, you know, the wheats and wheat pulses and stuff like that. But it's basically like every vegetable was developed by very sophisticated farmers here. Yeah. And uh, we think, you know, tomatoes is something. It's, no, it's not. It's native. It's North American, you know. Um, so, yeah, no, education, and it's, it's just true. And I always feel like, oh, it's another thing I should do is to try to write something for that age. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, thank you. It's very true. And Howard Zinn is great. Yeah, you know. Um, Fabulous. Yeah, he, he is. And there, there are many people too like him who are, who are just taking a you know, very good, honest look. And uh, you know, just throughout history, there's so much stuff that, that um, is easy, quickly and <laughs> conveniently skated over. You know, like with everything that's happening in our political landscape now, I've developed um, quite a uh, empathy for the regular German people during the 30s who were not, you know, Nazis and who were just, you know, stripped slowly, methodically of every right that they had until it was over, until Hitler could just arrest anybody he wanted to, right? I mean, that, that's where we were headed, I, I feel, politically, you know. So it's always, the stuff is, you know, it, it's, history needs to be taught much better, you know, for sure. Um, now, certainly, plenty of German people <laughs> saluted Hitler, but there were a lot of people who just got caught, you know, just got caught up and were opposing him and just, you know, didn't work, didn't work. You know? So, yeah, Zinn's great. Thank you. Are you, are you a teacher, a, a writer, um, an archaeologist? Um, you know, I, I just wanted to know all of your, I see your oh. talent. How do you well, see what happened, I had a weird kind of career path. I mean, I went to study marine science first. And then when I got out, though, Reagan was in and he was cutting every single environmental job. People forget, um, you know, they think how hard it is, you know, now under Trump, whatever. Reagan was terrible for the environment. He cut every single department, every single job he possibly could, opened up everything to drilling. He just was like, you know, whatever you want, you, you, you've got, because oil people put them in. Um, and he admitted it. It wasn't, you know, any secret or anything like that. So I came out with a degree in marine science, and there, was no, there were no jobs whatsoever. Um, so I had to go back. I went back, and then I studied economics um, and to just try to figure out, you know, a, a larger picture get a larger picture of what was happening 
uh, international economics and resource economics, and then did with the marine science, and then started to do some writing. But uh, no, I don't. I don't have any archaeology degrees or anything like that. But I uh, or anthropology, which would be, I guess, the normal thing here. But I just found that that um, the strictly it seemed like the strictly scientific approach, even like. Um, a lot of the great foundations in the United Nations and others are funding interesting projects, but it's all in the same paradigm. Don't and you? it's like putting Band-Aids on a bad paradigm. It's not going to solve the problem. You're just going to have some little project to say, oh, I have the success over here. You need a paradigmatic <laughs> shift in thinking. And that's where I started to see, you know, it, it already exists in, and it exists here in, in North America, right here, the, the paradigmatic shift that we need. So we just have to, you know, learn from the people whose land we're on to a large degree um, in terms of, you know, spiritual connection, um, you know, that will pr really make us think twice about yeah. quickly destroying things. So now that's, so that's my background in a nutshell. And uh, uh, I was actually involved with Native American things before I went work for the UN. And then, and then now after I'm get, you know, getting back involved a bit with them. So that's a nutshell. Thank you. You're very talented and you, you enriched all of us because there's so many books I want to read again, or, or and I, I've had an interest in it too. And uh, well, I would recommend you know, it's a great book. I mean, there's so many good ones. I mean, um, there, there are two. There's a very thin, slim volume written by John Mohawk. He didn't even take credit. His name's not on it. But it's called A Basic Call to Consciousness. You can get that on Amazon. Now. They're reprinting it. A Basic Call to Consciousness. He wrote that when a delegation of Hopi and some other tribal leaders, some from the Six Nations, uh, Iroquois, went to the UN in Geneva in 1977 to present what they said was, you know, look, this is our worldview. This is where you people are heading. This is what our prophecies say will happen if you keep on that path. Boom, here it is. So anyway, a basic call to consciousness. It's a very thin, very quick read. It is great. John Mohawk was fantastic. He, he died not too long ago, but you can get him on YouTube also, John. John Mohawk, he's great. He was a professor up at SUNY Buffalo um, and he was an Iroquois guy. Um, and I knew him. He was really funny and just really brilliant. Um, the other guy, Vine Deloria, his book is uh, God is Red. And, uh, you know, our R-E-D, God is Red, is another one that I would recommend to you. He's got a few that are really interesting. Like, he's got such a great sense of humor. His other book is called Custer Died for Your Sins, which is a great title, <laughs> I thought. But, uh, but Vine Deloria's God is Red is terrific. And then John Mohawk's Consciousness would be terrific places to start. Those are really, those are really good. But you know, there are contemporary authors who are writing now too, like Robin Wall Kimmerer. I read a book by her a couple of years ago. What was it called? Anyway, there are a number of, of, of authors, you know, people who are writing, and they're mostly women, you know, Native American women who are contemporary writers now, who are doing fantastic work. Uh, in poetry too. Um, you know, Linda Hogan and, uh, um, you know, many other people. So. Um, and it, you know, I like their writing because it's often very to the point, you know, and it doesn't waste a lot of time. It gives you time to just sit back and think about what they've said and written, you know, it isn't like, you know, stream of consciousness verbiage. It's like, boom, you know, here it is. And here's the next thought. And it's very rational. Uh, anyway, I like their writing. Well, thank you so much. You enriched all of us. And I can't wait to read both of those books. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely check the basic all the consciousness. Yeah. I love that. Okay. And thank you again, James. Be sure. Well, my, my, I'm happy. And my continue pleasure. writing and doing all this research. We need people like you. We do. Okay. And thank I you. hope you'll come back and talk no matter where you live. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got the house in South Orange. We're going to try to get back up there. So Blake, my son is up there now because Rutgers is closed. So he's, uh, he's in the house, you know, with COVID. What are you going to do? So. Uh -huh. Well, take care. Thank you again. And thank all of you. I hope you all stay well and be happy. And I'll see you next week or speak to you next week, whatever. Thanks again.